And now we are actually ready to proceed with our first panel. Um, and with me here is Serena Chadino. Serena is first of all part of the current female science talents intensive track batch. So she's one of our champions, to put it short, and she'll be moderating this session. She's affiliated with um, Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics, and I think she provides you with details herself now, so happy to pass the word over to you, Serena. Thank you so much, Julia, for the introduction. And yes, welcome everyone to the first panel. So I will um, bring uh, with me to the stage the, the panelists, the amazing panelists that we have today. So we have first uh, Juliane Beck, uh, who is one of our um, champions in the intensive track. And she's pursuing a PhD at the University of St. Gallen, working on uh, AI in migration control and uh, the regulation uh, that we need about that. So please. Um, what, uh, what the second, our second panelist is uh, Dr. Isabel Skierka Canton, which is the program, program lead for technology politics at the Digital Society Institute in, at the European School of Management at the, and Technology here in Berlin, and she's an expert on cybersecurity and uh, politics and government. So she can join her here. And the last but not least, we have Kat, uh, Kat Allman, who, who is the Vice President for Open Source Research at Digital Science and has worked uh, at Google for uh, more than 10 years and she's an expert in open science. So welcome. And... Shall we move over? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so as you can see behind us, our first panel is about new technologies and especially um, the potential of new technologies that we want to lift for uh, the whole of society. So, of course, new technologies do shape our lives in many in many ways, but often uh, the influence that this has is realized by the public only after the technologies are implemented. Um, in, in this panel, we want to discuss with people from industry, but also research and policy, uh, about how we can uh, regulate these technologies, but not only, like, what, um, what kind of um, actors from society should be involved in the debate about new technologies, and um, how we can um, use this tech to um, to work for everyone, to empower people, to bring about social progress, and to keep in mind the common good. So, let's start. So, first, uh, again, we have representatives of different um, uh, different uh, different categories, let's say. So we, we want to keep in this discussion really active the fact that we have different perspectives that we can maybe try to bridge or try to understand what the differences and similarities are between the approaches that you uh, you use in your in your work in your everyday life. Um, so first let's start to talk about why do you think it's important to uh, include actors from whole sections of society, from the whole of society, um, in the, uh, not only in the crafting of new technologies, but also in their regulation. What benefits does this bring, um, in your opinion? We can start with oh. Kat. Technology runs our world at this point. And so if we craft technology taking into account only one perspective, that technology then doesn't serve the world as a whole, it serves only a portion of that world. Uh, for example, at the risk of dissing on my geography, too much technology comes out of Silicon Valley, assuming the entire world has a massive internet pipe at their uh, constant disposal, which, as we know, is not true. So had we crafted so much of contemporary technology with an understanding that there are parts of the world that are differently resourced, personally, I think the world would be better. What about uh, Isabel from the perspective of policy and, and research? Yeah, thanks. So in political science, it's actually um, the baseline that you assume that everything is kind of imbued with um, social or political values and norms. And um, so in that sense, uh, I think the statement that we often hear, technology is neutral and, um, you know, it only depends on the application, is not entirely right, at least. Um, and I think in political science, we do examine um, exactly the distributions of power and who does what, uh, who does what uh, when and how and why, especially. So... Um, 
I think uh, from that perspective, um, and here I would also um, uh, also say uh, you're absolutely right. We need to look at who designs technologies, um, who creates them, and also who who deploys them onto the market. And I think um, it's very important for science. Um, to always scrutinize um, even technologies that that are already on the market and also development processes. Um, I think we can talk about some of the fields that um, we all examine in our research, like security and privacy, um, like algorithms and artificial intelligence and so on later on, but I think I would um, leave it at that for now. Thank you. And Juliane, what about your perspective? Yeah, um, I fully agree. Coming from the perspective of legal research and regulation, um, it's really the starting point. Everyone has the same dignity, the same fundamental and human rights. And this is also what we have to bring to the field, that we try to foster inclusive research on technologies, um, well, bring about innovative solutions, but really also have an eye on social justice and equity um, to have well a room for researching these technologies to bring about innovations but also have um, a strong framework a regulatory framework um, to safeguard that the rights of people are safeguarded whilst developing new technologies okay thank you so much um, what about the, the the best practice examples that maybe you have encountered in in your work like um, if we're talking about making technology work for everyone what would be like the way you go about it in your um, in your field both industry and research policy how concretely uh, would that come about uh, whoever wants can <laughs> <laughs> can um, I would say gatherings like this, bringing together people from all over the world, from different scientific disciplines, from different backgrounds, to uh, frankly get to know each other. Uh, the world works because humans know each other and care about each other, and getting together to work together, think together, break bread, makes that happen. Now, having said that, I appreciate that the world is much bigger than just those of us in the room. And so we need to be mindful of how we can do outreach to people who might not have the opportunities to be here to study at the kind of institutions you all work with and um, reach out to them and offer opportunities as equitably as we can. Thank you, that's so important, <laughs> completely agree your perspectives maybe on the research and policy side yeah so um i think i would approach it from the think tank perspective so it's kind of research but also more practical and um, close sometimes close to industry as well and i would say um that as i said before it's really important to constantly um you know, look at new developments and what is out there and scrutinize that. And then, um, you know, if we look at regulatory developments, um, they are often triggered by um, impulses from um, uh, civil society, for example, or uh, other research organizations, um, scientists themselves that publish groundbreaking papers. Um, and uh, that can then trigger a policy or a regulatory process. Um, and uh, during those processes, it's really important to pay attention at what is written into the regulations, for example. As we see now with the Artificial Intelligence Act uh, at the EU level, there are lots of other acts actually regulating technology at the European Union level. So I speak about the EU because that's just what I'm familiar with. Um, and uh, even when it comes to digital identity as well, cybersecurity and all of these things. So you, you, we really need to uh, follow that. And I think um, uh, at the same time also not forget that a lot of technology is uh, specified in standardization committees, which are um, not very open or transparent all the time, because simply because it's not always understandable what's going on there for, for many people. So I think we need to pay attention to these different um, rooms where things are decided and um, involve different perspectives and different um, people. So that uh, also um, concerns, um, as a practical example, if you uh, design technologies, they need to be accessible for people with uh, disabilities. And I think a lot of, uh, you know, if we look at one field I've been working on, like identity management, um, that has often been a, a blind spot, really. So um, I think th this is just one example, but that's where why uh, diversity or diverse teams 
are so important and um, involvement of these voices uh, even by organizations that represent them in civil society. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Liane, what about um, maybe perspectives from your, um, your work? I think starting a bit um, more wide, there are amazing examples of new technologies in various fields in medicine, on the job market, and in social insurance systems. Even also in, in migration management, there are systems who, when people migrate to a new country, allocate them to certain regions so that they can best integrate, can find job opportunities, um, find people to connect with. So there, well, this is the good examples I talk about. There are also quite dangerous examples, um, for example, in the field of risk screening. Um, but I think even in the examples that hold a lot of opportunities, still we are faced with risks, especially um, with regard to the right to data protection, privacy, to not discrimination, also the right to a fair trial. And I think the biggest obstacle in new technologies, mostly advanced AI systems, is that they are really not transparent. There's this whole um, phenomenon of, of black box so that you don't see um, or don't understand the inner workings of these systems. And then it is also really hard for people negatively affected by these systems to then challenge what has happened um, for, for the ones being affected, but also for maybe a judge who is then in a the position to decide on a case. So um, I think even when there are opportunities and good sides, we also have to have an eye on what might be a danger, what might be a risk in these technologies. Yeah, that's, um, it's fantastic that you both uh, mentioned this because I think it's really important uh, if we have um, these new technologies that are you know, regulated also in a complicated way that not everyone can immediately understand. I think the challenge is, um, of course, to, to bring it to, to the level where people can understand. But this brings maybe um, the, the conversation to a, to a broader topic. Like if we have uh, a technology that often uh, democratizes uh, knowledge like say everyone can can google something right and there is um it, there is a risk or there is a what actually happens is that we don't need experts um, as much, right? In a sense that, or at least we think we don't. Uh, so the, the role of um, mm. maybe experts in, in some field uh, kind of uh, decreases. What about, do you think this, uh, this is relevant for what you were saying, especially, um, say, for example, in the very complicated regulations of uh, AI systems and uh, that maybe you encounter in your work, um, that it's really challenging for... Um, uh, you know, for for people to understand this, if they're not, if they don't have the expertise in that particular field, how can we um, maybe bridge this, um, the, the complications of new technologies and their regulation and their use with, uh, you know, um, different actors in society who might not have uh, the expertise to to delve into the details? Um, is it the responsibility then of the uh, of the people who, who design or craft uh, these um, these technologies to? do better outreach uh, somehow or what would be some some idea um that you would have on this maybe okay. Isabel, since you mentioned <laughs> um yeah thanks that's a good question um i would say that actually uh, the internet and all that knowledge being available really helps um for people to understand better what's going on in regulation including me like i look at the internet a lot to understand all of that um i do think as well that um of course uh, so so you asked who should make that knowledge available i think of course it's the institutions um again looking at the eu you know the european commission um they have great uh, outreach staff and they they communicate quite a lot about um their policy uh, endeavors um at the same time as i um as i mentioned before for those civil society organizations, um, think tanks, uh, research institutions, and universities as well, are extremely important to um, uh, kind of um, make uh, not only make the content of these regulations accessible, but also um, to uh, to assess those and evaluate them uh, on a rolling basis, by the way, as well. And um, they can also raise ideas on on even on their application because regulation often is also a little bit broad, um, depends on the regulation, but it can be broad. And so um, when it comes to the nitty gritty of implementation, we really need to um, evaluate them on a rolling basis. And I think um, this is why so civil society organizations um, and those research institutions are really important. Um, I'll stop there. There's also lots more to say, of course. Um, 
at maybe what's about uh, what's the perspective of the private sector uh, in this matters because of course it's different uh, if the, te the technology comes uh, you know from a pri private sector and it's regulated by them maybe there are some differences or some challenges challenges yes <laughs> um, I can't speak for private industry because it's a big place um, personally I I think it loops back to the idea of inclusion so that you get, as you're creating things, you consider more perspectives, more needs, uh, disabilities. It's, sorry, it's such a, a hard thing to describe. Um, personally, I think that industry is foolish and is leaving, frankly, money on the table if they don't consider, to begin with, the various possible possibilities of their customers, their users, as they are designing and implementing the product. Um, that said, do a lot of companies do that? I think too few do. Um, I would like to think, based on the past 30 or 40 years, that things are getting better, but there's a lot of uh, a lot of ground left to cover in terms of improvement. I wish I could be more optimistic. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely um, one of the biggest challenges, maybe that also the sector is encountering. Um, Juliani, I'm curious about uh, the fact that you're taking human rights uh, into account, right, and the biases that new technologies um, will probably have in this uh, in this very sensitive um, sector, like migration control and border control, and so on. Um, so, what what are the main challenges uh, that you're trying to um, to maybe address uh, in your work regarding biases, mostly? Yeah, in a way, I think it's really the question of how to rein in the technology, the technology that has already been created or is sort of on the stage of being released. And um, for me, I think because you were talking about the design phase and um, how important it is, I think it is of utmost importance to really think about how do we want to create technologies. In a way, it has been in an research has been taking place in an open field, and there have been ethical code of conduct and sort of vague regulations or ideas about regulation. And now, regulation is taking shape, and the European Union will, I think, by um, the beginning of next year, pass um, the AI Act if everything goes as planned. Um, and there are good, some good approaches, I think, in it. Most um, importantly, a risk-based approach they introduce. Um, but I still think we should focus more on the question of how to design these systems um, and also think about, OK, can we design them in a way so that they, from the start, do not um, purposefully interfere with fundamental rights or that there is at least a risk of interfering? Um, and we should be honest, if there is such a clear risk, then we should refrain from bringing these products on the market. For example, there has been research going on on emotion recognition, emotion recognition systems to check people wanting to cross the border via this emotion uh, recognition system. Um, it was a facial lie detector, in fact, um, <laughs> and to support people doing um, the screening at the border uh, to know whether the people wanting to cross the border <clears throat> is lying or not and I think this is and the scientific basis is so so crude and also the results have really not been reliable and still research is going on and I think here this is a clear example where we should say okay we we obviously at the moment would need a ban because it is not possible to bring these systems on the market in a fundamental rights compliant way so and for me, this is why the design phase is so important and check, okay, whether certain requirements can be complied with, but then there's also the human machine interaction. So the people really employing the system, is he or she able to understand what's going on? And then um, the last phase would be sort of a question of social control. Will people who are affected by these systems be able to claim their rights to also understand in a way what has happened and um, to react um, in an appropriate way. Yeah, I think this is a perfect example where uh, the people affected might not have the knowledge to uh, to actually react to what's happening to them. And also, uh, yeah. Isabel, you wanted to mention? 
Yeah, I think that's a great example because um, uh, as is and it's similar, the ban on facial recognition technologies. Um, so the AI Act, um, at least the European Parliament, wants to ban um, the use of facial recognition technologies in public uh, places. And so um, here, I think what we can see in, in this um, example and also in yours is that there's always a... Um, you need to do a lot of stakeholder management because there are so many conflicting interests, right? So here we are probably all um, of the opinion that uh, what you described is, should not be deployed. But if you go to a law enforcement conference, um, the opinions will be very different. And in the political space, you have to um, then um, ha yeah, combine all of these different views and kind of get to a compromise outcome uh, that still uh, hopefully, of course, um, respects uh, fundamental rights. And I think, but I think this is where, now we are not in the research space anymore now, but I think I just want to say that in order to show that um, I think we need to make sure that research results get implemented into practice as well, and that might require some um, interest, uh, um, uh, yeah, PR, uh, public policy work, let's say it like that. Yeah. There's a program at the Bergstrom Institute at Harvard to bring current neuroscience work about emotional development in adolescence to the judges making decisions about sentencing of youthful offenders. And it's had an amazing positive impact on how these individuals are treated by the justice system when the judges are given current information about the emotional development of adolescents. So that kind of cross training and keeping people abreast of current science versus um, long-standing assumptions can be really helpful. Yeah, and as you all mentioned, it's something that cannot be done without collaborations of different actors, compromise even, polit whether political or uh, from different sections of society, but definitely <laughs> that's the way, right, to take all perspectives into account, and that's the challenging, uh, the challenging part. Um, what about um, bias in terms of, of gender? Um, do you have any examples that you might bring to the table uh, regarding new technologies and their, and their biases? Yeah, um, if Go no one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think there are lots of, of examples, um, especially in the uh, field of AI. AI algorithms, but I want to mention one from uh, the field of cybersecurity and privacy in which um, I'm um, working, and um, that is uh, spyware and stalkerware, right? So um, uh, actually, um, those technologies um, w are kind of surveillance technologies that can be installed on a mobile phone, on a mobile device, without the owner or user of that mobile phone knowing about that. And it's um, often sold uh, legitimately, actually, um, as kind of child uh, protection um, apps that run in the background. So um, the user of the phone, for example, doesn't uh, see that this is happening. However, um, a lot of those uh, technologies have been used um, to, for uh, abuse and in partnerships, um, usually uh, abuse of women by their partner. Um, and uh, so... I want to mention an initiative because so this has been taken up by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is an, a civil um, rights, uh, electronic rights organization in the US. And um, they've partnered up with researchers, Kaspersky, a cybersecurity firm as well. So here um, you have uh, those different actors as well. And they founded a coalition against stalkerware. And that has been quite successful, I would say, because um, now... Uh, the um, existing uh, legal frameworks in many countries are being updated in order to um, finally uh, also include um, the digital sphere of stalking and, and bullying and um, as well. So I think um, so. It's a it's a process that is still ongoing, um, and I think uh, that is um, one good example uh, for for an initiative like that. Fantastic. <laughs> um, since, since you mentioned the, um, the, the pace that sometimes these te new technologies are developed, um, it's often different from the pace of regulation, right? <laughs> that the, the timescales are quite different and sometimes it's hard uh, for the regulation or for the 
for politics to keep up. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, thanks. Um, actually, I forgot to mention that. And it's um, it's a super important point. And that's what we struggle with all the time. <laughs> Because um, what you get then are kind of first movers. And then you have an ex post uh, regulatory framework. And it's, um, as you said, you need to start with the design phase and so on as well. So um, Uh, in, in this case of this coalition, what they do is they cooperate with technology firms. Um, so, for example, Google um, has been banning uh, stalkerware that they knew about from their app stores already. So I think that's a first step. And I think that, um, you know, you can also circumvent uh, regulation or at least um, be a bit quicker if you interact directly with the big Uh, powerhouses in the field, right? And we all know who they are, um, depending on which uh, field, but usually in tech, it's like, they're quite obvious. And with AI now, we obviously have new ones. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's really hard to keep up, I guess, with the, with the pace. Maybe Kat, you have some perspective on this? <sighs> Sadly, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, Currently, uh, I come from a background of open source software development. And on the one hand, I would say approximately 90% of the global technology includes open source software somewhere in its tech stack. So great, except there's currently regulation in front of the EU government that has, I'm not a lawyer, but As I read it, it has the potential to essentially eliminate open source development by all but only a very few very well-financed companies, which basically guts open source. So on the one hand, you need this to run your power systems, your telephone networks, your air traffic control systems, your point of sale. On the other hand, you want to prohibit the people that created the software in the first place from continuing to update the software, keep it secure, et cetera. Um, I hope I'm wrong, mm. but this is an example of where the good intentions of government doesn't necessarily go deep enough to understand all the interdependencies that are present in a piece of technology. Um, how do we get around that? Um, I don't want to say, let's slow industry down, because I work for a commercial company. Um, maybe speed government up, or more <laughs> importantly, yeah, I know, thank you for laughing. <laughs> um, pull in, again, greater diversity into policy making, mm. and offer more resources to the people putting, to the politicians, so that when these kinds of legislations are presented, they are um, better thought out, hopefully. Fingers crossed, as we <laughs> say in America. Yes, um, this brings me to um, Juliane, since you work in the, in the legal framework, right? Do you have the impression that it's hard to, to keep up with the, with the pace of new technologies? How yeah. Do you have any suggestions <laughs> for... <laughs> Actually, it is, and the EU AI Act is a quite good example when the European Commission um, Yeah, brought up its proposal for the EU AI Act in April 2021. We hadn't been talking about generative AI foundation models and now this has really sort of toppled the whole discussions and the debate of how to deal with it and how to update the EU AI Act. And there's still a struggle going on on how to deal with these new systems. So this is really a good example of how difficult it is for regulation to keep pace and then also to sort of in a way, anticipate what is going to happen and um, how we might find a framework for that. Maybe to get back to the question of bias, especially gender bias, um, well, it's just that in my work I've read also about that and good examples are in healthcare, for example, but mostly in, in jobs like um, when you have an algorithm helping to find a suitable candidate for a certain position. and. Um, AI systems are trained with historical data and in the past, well, it was mostly men who got the highest positions and then, well, you will ref have this reflected in the data and then the algor algorithm reproduces um, the bias which has been there in society. Another example would be um, granting loans or granting credits. In the past, usually women didn't apply for a credit. so 
there again we have a problem with the data. And um, this also leads me to the source of bias. Mostly it's either bias already represented in the data, so we really have to strive for representative data sets. But there might also be bias in the design of, um, of these systems. So often it's not that people are really aware of the, the, their own bias they carry within them, but still, if there is a certain bias and they program a system in a certain way, the bias will be sort of in the system and it will be reproduced. And then also when many systems now operate with sensors and also take in data sort of on the go, but then you also have interaction bias in a way. So our society is full of biases, so um, we really run a risk of reproducing these biases on a constant basis. And um, this is also, I think, where research has to start working on more properly to, yeah, I, I think m most people know about these problems and try to address them, but it is just really difficult um, just when we start with the data to really create representative data sets. Thank you. That's, I think that catches on a super important point. This reproduce, uh, just the fact that biases just get reproduced just from people who design the systems, but also from the data sets that you use. So I would like to ask you um, what in innovative or new uh, ideas have you come uh, across uh, in, your, in your field to maybe address this issue or other issues related to, um, to biases and to the, the crafting of new technologies? Whoever wants to start. They're all looking at me. <laughs> 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 Frankly, I think simply raising awareness of this as an issue has had a positive impact. I think there are economic forces which are delaying widespread adoption of more um, inclusive design decisions, um, habit, inertia, and the availability of inclusive data sets. But I personally have been cheered by the, um, just the interest and attention and attempts to fill those gaps and create those data sets. So not to be too optimistic, but I think it's gonna get better, I hope. Um, I think economic forces, people don't wanna spend the money up front, but there's money to be made and I'm hoping that the latter encourages people to get over the former. Yeah, I think the economic argument is probably the most <laughs> powerful one, but there are risks, of course, down the line if all these perspectives are not taken into account. Oh, definitely. Um, the world is an interconnected place, and we forget that at our peril. Indeed. What about your perspectives? Um, yeah, I think uh, I, I would uh, first of all agree with you. Um, I also noticed, um, going back a bit to the uh, practical side of policy, um, you know, we had this AI safety summit in the UK last week, I think. And uh, there we talked about all these like apocalyptic uh, scenarios of what could go wrong with AI, with like a super powerful AI. And um, I liked what, um, I think it was the US vice president, um, she, she gave a speech and she um, actually said, well, yeah, that's, you know, those dangers are all real, but um, there are other dangers just around the corner, which are much more immediate. And those relate to exactly the dangers that you just pointed out, uh, profiling, discrimination, um, uh, and so on, um, when it comes to credit scores, jobs, applications, um, and, you know, which can really like, um, decide upon people's lives, uh, t trajectories or health. And I think um, here we can see that I think the discourse emerging from science and from civil society organizations um, and the transparency, as you said, that this has created has already helped a lot. And um, I think this is, uh, this is one tool that we can use as scientists and um, in other uh, public facing functions, let's say. Um, I also think that, uh, so um, Ms. Verhead uh, talked about uh, funding, and um, I think this is really important. I mean, um, when, you, uh, when you, you can decide, or the agencies, um, in my case here in Germany, for example, can decide which projects to fund. And um, for example, in the UK, I've come across a few um, projects, even in this kind of narrow field of cybersecurity, that um, really fund uh, 
gender-based um, uh, cybersecurity programs. So, for example, um, they look at digital violence or um, gender-based Internet of Things and, you know, and the security and privacy implications. And I think here, you know, they're all these... This, this is a niche, but you can, you can um, really, you know, promote that at a much broader um, field. And then uh, some of the tools that Mrs. Uh, Berher mentioned, of course, as well, which I won't repeat. So I think these are um, really important tools. Thank you. Yeah, maybe next to these examples, what might be a good path to follow is to really introduce impact assessments before a system is brought on the market. So I think this is also done within companies that they check, okay, what um, consequences might launching the product have. But I think to really implement it on a regulatory level, that would be quite helpful. At the moment, um, the EU AI Act proposal only foresees uh, conformity assessments, which mostly boil down to self-conformity assessments. So we don't really know how effective this will be. But I think uh, to really implement um, impact assessments and also have independent supervisory authorities to check whether the requirements are really complied with, that would also be a good further step forward to complement what, what we've just what we've just heard. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And um, to wrap up, uh, what about uh, your um, your personal experiences in your in your different fields? And um, I would like to know if uh, you maybe uh, what kind of path you have taken, and um, if you encountered any challenges, and maybe how you overcame them. So this can be uh, of use to the, to our audience and <laughs> to everyone who wants to learn from them. Well. <clears throat> as the oldest person on the panel, I'm going to go out here and say things are so much better than they used to be. Um, thank goodness. Um, for To give you a horrifying example, I was in a staff meeting one time where a middle manager announced her pregnancy and the highest ranking person there looked at her and said, well, you are going to get an abortion, aren't you? Now, nowadays, people probably wouldn't say that. <laughs> and to this woman's credit, she looked at him and said, no, if I was going to get an abortion, I wouldn't have announced it at a staff meeting. And he did apologize, which was great. But the fact that it was out there. Um, when I started in industry, help wanted ads were segregated by gender. So if you were a woman, you just couldn't apply for certain jobs because they weren't available to you. Talk about old data sets and built-in bias. So while there is lots of work to be done, I personally am very happy that things are getting better. And I would like to believe that with the work of all of us in the room and everybody else out there, hopefully, things will continue to get better. Yeah. Um yeah, so it's a personal question, <laughs> um, but I think it's important to discuss. Um, uh, I think things are getting better. I, I have to say, um, so I work both in this sort of academic space and in this um, policy space in Germany. Um, so those are the constraints. And what I'm about to mention, in the academic space, I have the feeling um, things, at least in political science, I know it's different in STEM, I think, uh, things are quite open, I would say. Um, so there's uh, especially lots of young women, um, you know, PhD students and professors. Um, so, and I found a lot of inspiration and mentorship um, in female uh, professors. So that's, that was really great. In the, um, on the more practical side of things, um, I think it's a bit harder, um, you know, especially in Germany when you go to some conferences or meetings with um, with policymakers. I think it's just um, really, let's say, um, dominated by um, uh, men who are a bit a bit older. Let's say, okay, so um, <laughs> and and so in that sense. It's uh, it's a little bit more um, challenging. I've I've had great mentors and that uh, from this group as well. So I don't want to say that um, you know all of them are alike, but of course uh, you might feel a little bit lost at first. Or there are certain power dynamics that work in a certain way, and um, I and I still find it a little bit uh, difficult sometimes to understand them and to play by these rules or not to play by them, but then uh, you know kind of find your own ones. Um, 
yeah, I think enough said. I think, um, yeah, you can maybe, you probably all encounter these challenges. And um, I think it's just really important to be assertive, um, even even if that might come across as too assertive sometimes by mm. some people. And, yeah, <laughs> Hard to judge the right level of yeah, and, assertiveness, um, right? And I also want to say I just became a mother a few months ago, and yeah, <laughs> no, um, so it's also very personal, of course. But um, uh, I think that, um, or what I hope is that, what I can see now the perspective of mothers, which is a really eye-opening experience, because um, when you have a little baby, and you still want to continue your uh, professional. Um, career uh this can also be it can be quite challenging to combine both and i think uh you know you just re really need childcare and all of that i mean it's really basic but i just wanted to throw it out here because um and we can talk about that later because i think it, it just opened my eyes uh to a new uh sphere of life <laughs> thank you so much yeah my own experiences have been rather mixed, I'd say. So, for example, the uh, research project I'm employed in, we are seven, I'm the only woman. So when, when I got the position, I was really like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's uh, going to be maybe a bit hard. The team is nice, so um, it didn't turn out to be a problem, but still I was stunned that I was the only woman. Um, my supervisor, actually, he tries to promote women and also fills position at his chair with women. So that's a quite positive aspect. But I think the um, the face that I draw most from is actually my uh, co-supervisor. Um, she's uh, from Queen Mary University in London, and she's really also like my mentor. And um, this is also, well, again, speaking about mentors, um, it's just incredible the support I receive and um, the exchange I have with her. So, um, yeah, this is just quite a quite good example and I think also um, well I haven't talked with her um, in detail about that and about the experiences she's made in in science but I still think also because of her experiences is just uh, what I guess that she tries to be really supportive and she's got a lot of PhD um, candidates um, from from London but also from other universities um, who are female and um, yeah I think this is a quite good sign she also sends. Fantastic. It's great that there is a community <laughs> that we can at least rely on. So I would also like to ask you, what's your um, your vision or your hope uh, for the future in your, in your specific field? Do you have any um, wishes or <laughs> uh, something similar that you would like to be realized in the, in the next future? My personal passion which I happily get to do for a living now, is interdisciplinary research, mm -hmm. bringing together people from different parts of science and industry to collaborate and share knowledge. Because to me, where the edges of things bump up, I like beaches. I like the intersections of elements. And I really think that's a place where a lot of innovation and a lot of positive change and a lot of social change as well can come about by bringing together people with different perspectives. So that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, um, I second that. Uh, and um, I try to do that myself as well, but it's really hard. So I think um, I, I that would be one wish I have as well. Uh, another one would be... Um, not always to be the only woman uh, at panels and so on. So here it's great. So I'm really happy that my wish is fulfilled today. But uh, yeah, and in general, I, I wish that there's not this kind of only one mentality or even, you know, thing that uh, many women have to uh, or feel when, when they are. And I think sometimes it can prevent um, meaningful collaboration, cooperation, um, and I, I wouldn't even say only women, but uh, including persons of color and and other um, and and people with different abilities and so on. So I think um, this would be my wish that uh, you know when you go to I, I just find these conferences as well so much nicer to participate in, and I always get so much more out of it than if you listen to very similar perspectives all day long. Honestly, yeah. Yeah, I fully agree. I'd also be quite happy to have this um, inclusive sphere um, and yeah, also more yeah 
promotion of um, of women in science especially and I think this is great that we have this format and um, the space to really connect and exchange so um, I'm super grateful for the opportunity and I really think it is getting better in, in so many different fields of societies um, but still I think especially since you said you've uh, just become a mom and I think it's still more difficult for, for women sort of handling these two roles to sort of pursue the career and still sort of also um, have the role in the family. And um, yeah, I think also society really um, has a responsibility in opening up opportunities and making it easier for women to bring both together in a way. And for men as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Indeed, <laughs> absolutely. Um, what about uh, your um, some some hope for the the specific field um, that you're in? Would that would that ring a bell? Like, where do you see uh, your field maybe going in the next uh, in the next few years if positive develop positive developments uh, keep happening and mm -hmm. move forward? Uh, like I said, I think things are getting better, which and I need to pause for a moment, I still run into people who say, oh, women are biologically unsuited mm. to work in computer science. Um, so it's not all sunshine and roses. But I do think it's getting better. And um, yeah, I don't really have much to add. I, I think we just need to essentially keep going and um, challenge people. I was in a uh, communication class where the instructor, who up until that point had been wonderful, and then he made a suggestion about being aggressive. And I said, well, some people in Silicon Valley don't like it when women are aggressive. And he's like, oh, well, you should flirt with them. I'm like, dude, <laughs> old enough to be your grandmother. I'm not going to flirt with some <laughs> random guy. <laughs> so there's, there's work to be done. <laughs> But I'd like to think <laughs> if we stand up for ourselves and keep going, things will continue to get better. Um, yeah, I think uh, I don't have much to add. I think I, uh, the interdisciplinary character of uh, of future research um, is and current research is great. And I, I would hope that this continues because I do think that you get much more diversity um, like that in, in projects. Because only then can you really understand the full effects of technology or even the full, full um, aspects of creation of, a, of technologies um, only if you involve those different perspectives. Yeah, so if you have an engineer, you might not really think about the social implications, for example. Yeah, maybe again from the perspective um, of regulation, I just hope that the EU AI Act will um, soon be passed and it will be a strong regulation with um, a focus also on fundamental rights protection. It will be a challenge also in the final phase of the negotiations to really balance um, sort of um, the interest in fostering innovation and um, also creating a space to develop new technologies, but also to really safeguard rights of, of individuals. So to bring both together and to have a good, a well-balanced and strong reg regulation. So that will be my hope for the immediate future. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. So we end on a hopeful note. And um, thank you, uh, thanks to all of you for your um, perspectives, your broad perspectives and complementary perspectives sometimes. And I think we heard um, quite a few <laughs> ideas and we had food for thoughts, a thought, so definitely I did. Um, so what about opening um, to the audience for the discussion? Uh, we were we open for questions or comments uh, and welcome your perspectives as well. So feel free to, please, we have already a question. Uh, thank you for a wonderful panel. My name is Rana Dejani. I'm a professor of molecular biology from Jordan. Uh, my question to you slash comment is that uh, one thing that I think is important to change a lot of the things that we've been talking about is to have all the stakeholders in the room. And if we look around, we don't have many men, <laughs> right? So I think that's important because if they're not here, 
we're just talking to ourselves to a certain extent. They need to be part of that conversation. Which lead, and that's part of what was commented, that when you design, you need to make sure that everybody's in the room designing those and to creating the rules together for collaboration and to have everybody's voice. So my actual question is as follows. I'm here currently with the Robert Bosch Academy, and we went to Dresden and met with some refugees. And actually there was a woman who's doing her PhD, she's Syrian, and her problem was not that she was a female. Her problem was that her professor told her, but you're never gonna amount to anything. You're only here temporarily, you're going back. Mm -hmm. So why should I even sub, uh, help you in your PhD thesis? You're, there's no job for you. And, and, and she said, this was like, so you know, you have the first you're a female, then you're uh, a, a mm -hmm. refugee migrant or whatever the status, and not being respected. And she's not a lone thing. This happens all over the world. And again, how many uh, in this room are coming from diverse backgrounds, right? So we're just setting these out. How do we create the collaboration? How do we create these conversations? And what do you suggest, each one of you, um, how do we make sure we are uh, more conscious and invite people? Because it really ha needs a conscious effort. It's not going to happen by itself, because that never happened for women. Uh, so that's my question. Thank you. I'm going to say, Rana, you're absolutely right. It requires all of us to make that effort. Um, you've been to Science Foo Camp, which is what I work on now. In the beginning, the first year, I wasn't there yet, 6% um, women. At this point, we have, depending on the year, between 38 and 46% women. And that's because I make the effort to identify these people, invite them. I won't say hound them, maybe a little nagging, but, uh, and we have travel funds available. And I'm doing the same thing for geographic diversity. Um, and it's work, and that's fine with me. I am happy to do the work, and hopefully we all are. Yeah, thank you. I mean, um, the story you described is uh, shocking, but um, I also know it's not the only example. And um, personally, I I think this is a very limited view of um, of science, uh, of the scientific community, actually, um, that this professor, but maybe, uh, um, or many other uh, professors also have, because in the end, it's about fostering collaboration, right? And like in so I've um, studied abroad as well, and you can collaborate with many people across the globe, and this is great about science. So um, I think uh, I have to say in Germany, um, if you look at the policy community or also university community, it's still very white, right? So I think we are not yet doing a great job at uh, really having those di this diversity of perspectives. Um, in our university system. And I think um, we could do a lot more. And I think there are policy instruments here. Um, so I think it's not only the universities, but also actually policymakers to um, really adapt their migration laws, the um, uh, recognition of degrees from abroad and so on. Um, that really needs to change. And, uh, you know, it's um, still a, an extremely bureaucratic process here. Um, so even when I want to get my degrees from the EU um, recognized in Germany, if I want to apply somewhere to a job or so, it is difficult. And I don't get that because we have uh, an EU um, space already, right? So it's even more difficult for people from abroad. And I think um, here we need to address um, policymakers. Um, yeah, uh, I think I'll leave it at that. I think uh, we could also discuss more details and who uh, should be approached. And um, there are already certain initiatives, of course. Um, but uh, so these are, this is kind of the legislative side and so on, or the hurdles that exist there. And then, of course, it's a mindset question as well. And I think the professor you quoted, in my opinion, doesn't just also doesn't have the right mindset to um, to educate internationally leading uh, PhD students or to lead international research. Yeah, I fully agree. I think first we, we have the state level or the more bureaucratic level where things have to change. But really, this example shows that so many people have a shocking mindset in a way and that but that also our responsibility lies in really interacting with the people just surrounding us. And when you witness a situation like this, to also have the strength to address this professor, to really tell him, well, this is this is wrong. Why do you sort of close all the doors? You Maybe he doesn't even know about her, um, her status, uh, whether she might have um, 
a status where she's got the right to stay for longer than her PhD or even with the PhD has good perspectives to stay in Germany. So it seems as if this statement was so fully inf uninformed and so sort of ripped out of context and that it would be also important to really address him and um, exchange with him so mm -hmm. that he maybe changes his, his own attitude and mindset. So... Um, Thank you. Any more questions? Simone? Hello. Should I stand up? Uh, hi, I'm Simone and um, I would like to pick a bit on the, on the actual topic of the panel, which was how to lift the potential of new technologies. And um, in the, not pick, comment, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I used the wrong word. Um, and. Um, we discussed mainly this morning, but also in general in the discussions, how we need regulations for the technologies, how we need diversity for uh, regulating biases and all that. And um, um, we are all aware that the technology is uh, developing at a really fast speed, so regulations are really behind. And what I miss in the conversation, not only today, but in general, is the human perspective. So we are talking also about media literacy, like uh, that the population uh, learns how to use uh, the media and is becoming of their biases. Mm. But I miss a lot in the discussion in terms of regulation and policy, uh, the development of emotional intelligence of humans, uh, coping mechanism, um, mental health, um, yeah, so this parallel discussion is, is missing for me, so I'm wondering if it's not there, if it's not urgent, or if it's just in a completely different sector. Thank you. Okay, I'll dive on that one. Um, you're absolutely right that emotional intelligence needs to be baked in, in particular, given the growing threat of emotional manipulation by algorithm. We need all of us <clears throat> as individuals to educate ourselves, our colleagues, our children in particular, on how to recognize uh, when we're being manipulated by the technology around us. And that's, I mean, it's not just technology. We all need to learn how to um, recognize when people are attempting to uh, persuade us to their opinions, their perspectives, their power in unfair ways. Um, that's not easy. And frankly, I think AI is going to make it a lot harder. Personally, I'm very concerned about deep fakes. At this point, I basically don't believe anything I read online, um, mm. which is probably always has been a good thing, but I think we need to be aware of it more. Um, I was at a neuroscience conference a couple of weeks ago that was specifically about mind-body, or mind-brain, it was the name of the conference, and talking about how there's, if you will, hard science, but it's not divorced from human behavior and emotion and bringing those two together. So, broken record, we need to stay conscious and work at it, uh, which isn't necessarily an easy thing in the context of policy and economics, but I think on a personal level, we all have to be mindful and do it. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think um, it's an it's a very important topic. Um, again, when it comes to design and deployment of technology, and you also ask about um, regulation, so um, it's also a big topic. So I think um, if we address um, the disinformation angle that you also just mentioned, so there's definitely um, a lot happening right now in the regulatory space. We have this um, EU digital services. Um, Act, uh, you know, that um, addresses some some of these challenges that arise with respect to hate speech online, with respect to um, false uh, news or disinformation as well. Um, 
at the same time, it's uh, not necessarily enough, especially not when we consider, as you also said, that technology is moving at a fast pace. And, you know, if we look at deepfakes and, and so on, I do think that then um, one would also have to look at really like um, technical mechanisms or tools that we have um, and that uh, the um, providers of information, for example, can use and, you know, you can use encryption technologies or certain timestamps and so on. I mean, there are certain technical tools you can use from the security sphere um, to uh, to preserve the authenticity of information um, and its integrity, actually. Um, so th there's a lot of research going on there, um, especially also when it comes to AI. Um, but this is uh, not necessarily a regular topic, uh, regulatory topic yet. Um, I think it will become kind of a tool with which we can implement regulatory um, uh, demands in the end. Um, when it comes to other mental health concerns, um, of course, uh, you also mentioned the manipul man manipulative um, character of many apps. Like, you know, you had this conversation in the US, I think, a few weeks ago about um, TikTok and um and Facebook or um, Instagram uh, kind of manipulating um, teenagers and, and damaging their mental health and that um, there will be fines and uh, regulation here as well. Um, I think, so I don't want to go too much into detail because we could fill another panel on that, I think, but um, I think the problem is recognized and I've seen that um, actually ex-Silicon Valley uh, people have done foundations uh, to address this problem and so on, you know, like, so always take it with the grand grain of salt. But um, I think it's important um, to do to continue work in this field. And, um, you know, you will always have a conflict of interest um, for these companies because um, these manipulate manipulative <laughs> mechanisms, um, uh, you know, that are actually emerged from the gambling industry uh, research as well, um, are so uh, good for their business models that they don't have an incentive necessarily to change this. And then in the US, you have a body like the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, who can, for example, then rein in. But, um, you know, uh, those are just some thoughts, really loose thoughts right now. Um, and I'm happy to discuss further. And I'm not an expert on this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have um, very much to add. It's uh, a very good question and a uh, quite important topic. Maybe going back to the perspective of migration law and the uh, systems being employed or being planned for border control and migration management. There we've got the problem that only the perspective of states of um, EU member states are taken into consideration and their wish or their desire to keep unwanted migrants out of the union. But um, there is not really a perspective on, okay, what does this do with the people being affected by the system who are being subjected to the use of these systems? And um, I think we really need research also on what this, does this whole development do with the people affected by by these systems so uh, and this is really lacking at the moment yeah. thank you do we have any more questions okay oh, i'm i'm Smangeli. um i appreciate the the issue of open access because you know for for us especially in south africa the availability of resources uh, for the students, especially in, in education, it's very important. But the challenge, what I want to ask about... Can you take it a little more like this? Okay. Oh. Yeah, that's better. Okay, <laughs> with the issue of AI, with plagiarism, and looking at the students that we are producing now, the scientists, if they use it and then they do not have the knowledge, because the technology is there, they can access the information, even though there are, they were, so you have to, um, issues, you have things that are in place to avoid plagiarism, but it still happens. So how do we look out for that? I think the previous speaker was talking about the, the human space within technology, and I'm a person of humanistic sciences. So um, I just want to know, to say, as we are talking about um, accessibility, you know, people who are differently abled, I don't like use disability, people who are differently abled, to say how do we promote that space, a safe space where they can be included, even though the they technology disable them. Thank mm. you. 
Yeah, I'm. Uh, should I really? go for it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I think you um, you're raising a very important question, and um, also thank you for uh, introducing um, the term of um, a person of different uh, abilities, yes. because it's true that. Um, uh, it's not the person that is disabled, but it's uh, the technology that disables uh, the person in that sense, right? And so I think um, I think there's honestly, I mean, I speak from the German European perspective. Um, what I see is that there hasn't been a lot of emphasis on this perspective, to be honest. Um, and uh, to be honest, also not in my research uh, or what I've come across in the policy debate or political debate here. Um, I think what uh, it needs to start with, um, you know, when we look at technologies themselves, of adopting a very user-centric um, focus at first and um, looking at, like, who are your users? And I think the the reason why a lot of technologies haven't been um, able to address different users is also because... Uh, maybe because um, the people designing them were of uh, were very similar in their abilities and didn't think about that, or um, uh, yeah, just didn't think about the different kinds of users that technologies can have. And this is why, again, I think technology is not neutral; <laughs> it's enacted, and um, this is definitely something we need to work on. And um, uh, I would say, by the same tools that I mentioned earlier, I mean. Um, we need to, uh, you know, in the in the kind of, um, you, we need to raise awareness. This is already ongoing, but um, somehow make clear how important this is. I think, um, and uh, I think there can be guidelines as well, or um, even regulations in in some fields. But it should, I think, a guide guidelines should just be sufficient for that as well, um, and include these. Yeah, people with um, different abilities and sorts of uh, hackathons and all of these things, right? I mean, like whenever you do events where you want to include many people, it's important to really have diversity there in the teams as well. I think you nailed it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but um, but it's, it would be also something to discuss if you have uh, ideas. Honestly, um, because I'm, we are not experts either. On this. Thank you so much. Any more questions or comments? Oh, last one, maybe. There. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, my name is Annika Stechemesser and uh, in the debate you touched upon both the bias in historical data and uh, the issue of technology coverage today. And I think actually in combination these things are really worrisome to me looking ahead in the future. Um, in my research I use kind of these big data sets collected these days, for example from social media or from mobile phones to um, research how climate change impacts society. Mm -hmm. And my big worry is that we will like reproduce biases even in current research because the data sets these days do still not cover all of societies. I mean, when I, my results and they inform policy and I want them to inform policy, that's why I do the science because I want to do something with climate change. But at the same time, I'm very aware that there's like big geographical gaps in the research I do and also even within one country, a lot of my research is US-based just because there's a lot of data, there's still also a big bias in the societal groups that are covered. And I just feel like there's not enough awareness right now that we are still doing this, like we are still um, producing results which like structurally leave out individual societal groups and whole geographical regions. And um, maybe you can comment on like how we can kind of foster this discussion and also build some sort of capacity to, to collect these data because that's in the end what it is. And that's also sometimes a mismatch between government and private data because on the private level these data are often available but they're not shared with science or with anyone. Mm -hmm. um, but the go and the governments don't have the capacity to collect these data often. So this is the kind of space where I'm trying to operate and I th it would be really helpful for me to get like your perspective. Thank you. Well, speaking for myself, 
I get a little uncomfortable with the idea of governments as collectors of data on people's personal lives, just me. Um, I'm struck by the similarity with um, developing metrics for open source and other kinds of software productivity, um, particularly with community involvement, individual contributions. There's a tremendous push to have metrics, measurable results. What happens too often is that people measure what is easily measurable, not what actually matters. And I have concerns that we're building AI systems using data that's available instead of data that's actually valuable, aka inclusive. What do we do about that? That's the harder question. I hope that as awareness becomes more generalized, and frankly, as technology, uh, largely through mobile phone networks rather than landline-based technologies, um, that the data sets will improve organically. Um, again, because there's money on the table for companies that develop things which are inclusive. <coughs> I know there's efforts in Sub-Saharan Africa to develop African-specific data sets to feed the, the learning models. I don't know where they are in that process. Um, hope is free. I realize it may or may not be effective, but I'm going to go with hope and a certain amount of effort that things will get better. And frankly, the economic focus now on AI is so great that I think it'll actually come together pretty quickly, relatively speaking, assuming policy doesn't slow that down in ways which are harmful to this data aggregation. Um, I don't have much to add, but um, I would say that uh, data needs to get out of the, needs to get taken out of the silos. And I think there are a lot of uh, bodies, whether they're government or industry um, bodies uh, that have a lot of data. Let's think about mobility data, for example, or, you know, when we, when we think about smart cities, for example, or um, even smart, um, you know, countryside uh, areas. Um, I think um, at least when we speak about uh, Europe, um, let's say, I think there's a lot of data available that could be made available and that has to be made available in an open format and in an interoperable format as well so that it can be used really because if you have, um, and I guess you're familiar with that challenge, if you have um, a data and it doesn't, it's not interoperable, it's really hard to, um, to then process. So I think um, there are certain initiatives also already going on at the policy level. Um, yeah, just as a short um, final comment. Yeah, I don't have many insight into data selection processes or data availability. Maybe one thing that could help is within companies to have certain codes of conduct um, to start with at least. Um, well, this is then not binding, but maybe it would also raise awareness and also change the policy of how to collect data. I don't know whether it would be a good thing to do and f feasible to really also pu put this into regulation. Um, I would need more time to think about that, but still um, it's really important to raise awareness about that because we just know from so many different fields that we have the problem of bias and that it is challenging to create uh, representative data sets. So um, we should all try to keep on working on, on that part. Yeah. We also need to be mindful of the tension between wanting to create data sets and respect people's privacy and their intellectual property rights. Mm. Um, this is not an easy problem, but it's one that I'm, I know governments are wrestling with and I think all of us need to be mindful of as we push for more data, we also need to be mindful of where that data is coming from, aka people. Thank you so much. Okay, so it's time for our break. Um, feel free to keep the discussion going as you grab a coffee or something. I want to thank our panelists for the very insightful and lively thank discussion and, and the audience for the comments and the questions that kept it going. So thank you so much. <laughs>